Chapter 18 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Novelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 18 The Faked Atmosphere and Public Sales. The Art of Producing a Faked Atmosphere. Private Sales of Faked Objects of Art. Real and Spurious Noblemen as Elements in Creating the Desired Atmosphere for an Antique the various and endless possibilities in private dealing public sales auction sales various characters among frequenters of public sales la bande noire the trick of the sale catalogue as a proof of authenticity etc the part played in public sales by peter funk and the transformations of this helpful personage in most cases the art forger is provided with an indispensable accessory in the person of a co-worker who helps to dispose of the artist's questionable product advantageously this may be done by one agent or by many according to circumstances but the spirit of the mission is always the same to steep faking namely in another kind of fakery no less elusive and delusive the deception that serves to misguide judgment through false information about some particular object of art or to create a misleading suggestion around the work of art offered for sale the trick may be termed producing a faked atmosphere in plain words the creation of a false atmosphere of genuineness is an additional fakery to the success of a faked object of art or curio and it is a most multiform species of imposture and a very dangerous adjunct to the already deceptive trade so multifarious is the deception practice that an attempt to classify it in its diversity would probably fail to illustrate in full the metamorphoses of this supplement to the art of faking as this support to faking is chiefly concerned with the sale of objects of art our investigation can be broadly divided according to the kind of sale private or public the latter generally taking the form of an auction in private sales the limit is not so much set by the seller's conscience as his inventive powers and his more or less fertile imagination his method relies mainly on the power of suggestion brought about by false information or as we have said by the silent misleading glamour of a pseudo environment the former works principally with the decoy of invented documents calculated to lend certain objects an appearance of historical worth or wrongly to magnify their artistic importance it is not always the documents that are fitted to the faked art sometimes the case is reversed and the artist creates work to fit a genuine document the same is done with signatures more especially in painting and sculpture there are all kinds of specialists in the world of faking who can imitate artists signatures marks and so forth but alas it is not said that to a genuine signature our versatile and imaginative artist cannot supply a genial piece of fraud the only genuine part of which is represented by the signature this is often performed by painting over works that have been defaced either partially or completely and yet by some chance still bear the artist's signature in one corner generally the least abused spot of a painting whether on canvas or panel the same trick is carried out with equal facility in sculpture to illustrate what at first sight would seem more complex than fitting a painting to a signature it is sufficient to recall the false claudian group sold in perfectly good faith by monsieur mallet de Boulet to madame bois also a dealer whose experience like that of many others had a noisy sequel in court monsieur mallet de Boulet had bought the clay group some years previously the subject a satyr with a nymph was of the kind that the french call a pouleste for five years madame bois found no buyer it was after this long period of actual possession that she discovered the clay statuette to be not by claudian but in all probability the work of a noted faker of claudian's le broch and that a small bit bearing the signature and date both by the hand of claudian had been cleverly inserted at the side of the group the line of the join had been concealed by colour and patina the purchase money however was not refunded as the court accepted the theory advanced by monsieur senar acting for monsieur boulet that madame bois had after all enjoyed the possession of the group for five years and had perhaps put forward her claim because she had not been able to sell it on account of its objectionable character 
In the cases where the documents are the original ones and the work of art is not, the artist naturally creates his work in accordance with the indications given in the documents. The occurrence is not common, but it has nevertheless taken place. We have heard of a man ordering a portrait to be painted to fit a detailed description of one of his ancestors given in an old letter. The Florentine Prioristi and old diaries as well can be used for the purposes of such suggestion. An old family chronicle recorded a marriage with some detail, sufficient at any rate to inspire an art counterfeiter to model a small bas relief representing the scene. When the work was suitably coated with old patina, put in a 16th century frame and an old worm-eaten board fastened to the back, the authentic document was carefully pasted on as proof of genuineness. Possible combinations of this sort of scheme are endless and can be applied to almost every expression of curio dealing. What we have styled faking the milieu in order to enhance the value of a genuine article or to give additional effects to a falsified one trades upon the fact that a collector prefers to buy from a private house rather than a shop. This often appeals to him as convincing proof that the article is genuine and it also appears to confer a higher value by comparison with the surroundings in a shop. To humour this particular trait in the collector, environments have been faked as well as objects of art, and in the evil grand art we are illustrating they furnish today more often than not the proper dignity which aids highly profitable sales affected through private transaction. When a work leaves the faker's hands, there are many ways in which to give birth to the false and elusive dignity designed to lend importance and an air of genuineness. One of the simplest methods is to provide the work with a respectable passport in the person of a patrician, real or faked, according to opportunities. This decoy is prepared, of course, to swear that the object has been in his family for centuries. When the mansion is really old and the family of ancient lineage, success is practically assured. How a man can lend his name to such deception can only be explained by a form of degeneracy which, unfortunately, is not extremely rare in our times. It is known to be practised with proper genuine works and with forgeries. In the former case it helps the command of an extravagant price that would never be reached in a shop or through the hands of a dealer. In the latter, working through suggestion, it serves to dispel any lingering doubt from the buyer's mind. When it appears difficult to bring off the deal, in the case of forgery, the object is taken to the country by preference and placed in some old villa or mansion with the connivance of a genuine nobleman, who will receive a secret visit from the purchaser. All act in the antiquarian world, it must be remembered, savour of mystery and secrecy and play the dignified part of a member of a time-honoured family who collected works of art in years past. A sham nobleman may also give himself out as Count So-and-so and and safely act the part for a day or even a few hours. It must be borne in mind that this course of working by suggestion is very dangerous to the purchaser. By its silent and convincing method, art antiquaries of skill and veteran connoisseurs have been deceived. Another application of this deceptive scheme that relies on a favourable environment to help fraud is the sending of counterfeit objects to remote country places supposed to be unexplored. This also is based upon a psychological peculiarity in some collectors who still hope and believe that there are yet unsearched regions in the world of antiques, oases that have escaped the ever-vigilant eye of the trader. As a matter of fact, if anything like neglected corners exist where one may hope for a find, they are in large cities such as Paris or London, particularly the latter, where even Italian antiquaries go at times to hunt for what it would be hopeless to seek in their own country. Be it understood, the above two ways of disposing in private of pretended genuine antiquities are likely to be combined. The nobleman who charitably houses the masterpiece that the amateur is after completes the stage-like effect of the hatched environment with sham documents, etc. Among public sales it is, as we have said, the auction sale that offers the greatest possibility to those who falsify an atmosphere to put the client on the wrong track so profitably to the faker. 
as may readily be seen a false environment and any tampering with the elements that go to the formation of a right opinion as regards an objet d'art invariably lead not only to the acquisition of the wrong thing but to the payment of an exorbitant price for its worthlessness much that is amusing and that would bring home this point could be written on public sales enough to fill a bulky volume could be culled from what has taken place at the atrium auctionarium to the modern hotel duo or the historical sale room still extant and busy in london cicero tells us that one of the first auctions to be held in rome was the sale of property that sulla had seized from prescribed romans he also tells us with his usual rhetorical emphasis that all pompey's property was put up to auction and disposed of to the highest bidder by the praeco's lacerating voice this great sale included a large portion of mithridates treasure the catalogue of which cost thirty days work to the roman officials who took the objects in charge at this sale at cicero with redoubled emphasis rome forgot her state of slavery and freely broke into tears it may be but mark antony to be sure took advantage of this supposed public emotion and had all the valuable lots knocked down to himself at ridiculously low figures some of them it is said were never paid for at all by this audacious triumvir another famous auction sale in rome was that of jubba king of numidia who left his treasure to rome in the time of tiberius caligula was his own auctioneer and in this way disposed of furniture in his imperial palace that he considered out of fashion his example was followed by marcus aurelius who sold in the public square dedicated to trajan the jewels and other precious objects forming part of hadrian's private effects in order to pay his troops pertinax put up to public auction all commodus's property a most confusing medley of imperial effects an omnium gatherum ranging from the deceased emperor's gorgeous robes to the gladiatorial array he used in the circus and from his court jester to his slaves perhaps the most remarkable part of the sale was commodus's original and interesting collection of coaches an odd assemblage that should have been capable of stirring even julius caesar's blasé mind who it is said used to attend sales in quest of emotion they afforded him a certain stimulation for suetonius speaks of him as rather a rash and unwise bidder caligula's coaches were of all kinds and shapes there were some for summer with complex contrivances to shelter from the sun and cool the air by means of ventilators and some for winter devised in such a way as to give protection from cold winds others were fitted with a device that would now be called a speedometer a contrivance for measuring the distance covered by the vehicle the mania for sales went so far with the romans that at the death of pertinax the empire itself was put up to auction and knocked down to the highest bidder didius julianus although not so complex as the modern houses of public sale the roman atrium auctionarium was not simplicity itself the original auction sales of the romans consisted of the disposal of war spoils to the highest bidder in the open air on the battlefield or in a square of some conquered city in order to indicate the spot where the sale was to take place a lance was driven into the ground the name of subhasta was therefore given to these rudimentary auction sales which is the etymology of the italian word asta still used for auctions the tabulae auctionarii giving daily notice of the number and description of objects offered for sale were in some way the forerunners of the modern catalogue just as the preco might be considered the ancestor of the auctioneer or maybe the creer there were also amanuenses who wrote down prices and purchasers names as each lot was sold marshall tells of a curious incident at an auction in which a girl slave was offered for sale when the bidding failed to elicit a higher offer gilanius the celebrated auctioneer ended his eulogy of the beauty of the human merchandise by giving the young slave a couple of kisses what happened said marshall in his conclusion a buyer who had just made a bid of six hundred surstices on the girl immediately withdrew his offer times are changing 
it is no longer a question of selling slaves in our modern atrium auctionarium but the auction room itself has nevertheless remained about the same a great place of interest an assemblage of types such as old tongilius licinius and paulus who revived and modernized gather in our sale rooms elbowing the crowds of bidders among whom are shrewd clever buyers true impassioned collectors cool and self-possessed customers the auction room is no less freakish than in olden times there may be in fact reason in the refusal to bid for young slaves that the buyer considers defiled by the kisses of the auctioneer even if he were a galanius the man a la mode but we can find none for instance in what happened some years ago at the celebrated castellani sale in rome on account of castellani's high reputation among collectors and the fine things offered this sale gathered to rome a cosmopolitan crowd of connoisseurs while a fine capagiolo vase was under the hammer the employee who was exhibiting it to the public dropped it and it broke to pieces at the moment of the accident the object had just been sold to the last bidder who naturally enough immediately declared his offer cancelled as he had made a bid on a sound vase and not a heap of debris the auctioneer then proposed to put the fragments of the vase up to auction and a fresh start was made strange to say the second bidding reached a higher figure than the vase had fetched when offered to the public intact and in all its faultless beauty but for the consideration that the second sale may have tempted some who regretted that they had let slip the chance to bid on the fine capagiolo one would be inclined to deduce that in the world of curios an object acquires more worth the more it is damaged it is true that while a broken china vase is practically worthless a piece of finance does not lose value by being broken and put back together again if it does not actually rise in value as in the case of the castellani cafagiolo though to an outsider the auction room may doubtlessly appear very simple in mechanism it is rather a complex affair its atmosphere has engendered any amount of side speculation this is the more marked in such sales rooms as have by reason of the importance of the sales held in them in a way fertilized as it were every kind of speculation rochefort whose passion for bric-a-brac took him to the hotel duo almost daily has a good deal to say on this subject in his amusing book on auction sales in the celebrated parisian sale room a book by the way which is now almost out of print the witty frenchman deals at length with the odd characters and silent speculations that have all unnoticed and unmolested grafted themselves upon the popular institution of the rue duo and other auction sale rooms as for the types of frequenters they are of all kinds and the most nondescript character first comes the collector in all his most interesting and amusing personifications Rochefort divides the amateurs hanging about auction rooms into three distinct classes, which he subdivides into genres and sous-genres, to use the writer's own terms. According to Rochefort's classification, the first class consists, broadly speaking, of persons who pay more for an object than it is worth. The second is composed of collectors who generally buy a thing for what it is worth. The third and last comprises those who pay less for a thing than it is worth rochefort aptly observes that the three divisions resemble the classes of a school the students passing from the lowest to each of the more advanced classes the collectors of the first group all freshmen without exception are separated by rochefort into sincere art lovers and mere poseurs speaking of the sincerity of collectors and premising that sincerity does not always imply an intelligent knowledge of art rochefort wittily remarks there are people who with the greatest self-confidence buy a daub for a titian suffice it to say adds the writer that at the sale of monsieur patrero's collection a virgin of the flemish school possibly an ecoud or a guver flink was sold a murillo at the price of forty five thousand five hundred francs in this foolish acquisition insincerity is out of the question poseurs snobs and the like rarely carry their foppishly garbed insincerities to the length of paying such high prices for mere parade in reference to real connoisseurs 
to quote Rochefort again, who was certainly most well informed on the subject, he says that they are so rare that it is scarcely worth while to speak of them. The most genuine living exponent of the species is already a fake among faking, becoming, namely, the owner of expensive curios not for art's sake, but chiefly in order to be able to ask his friends, by the way, have you seen my collection, or the last masterpiece I have bought, etc. The poseur, however, in his flippant and manifold attitudes, may be certain that schemes of deception are multiform and always a match for any incarnation of this type. He is the prey, and there are all kinds of snares waiting for him, just as there are many ways of catching birds. A collector who does not belong to the general class of collectors is the private dealer, who all too often joins force with the black band of the sale room. Among the buyers at the Hotel Duo, there are to be found, says Rochefort, all manner of originals. Take, for instance, the maquilleur, who is a regular godsend to restorers of paintings. The maquilleur is a purchaser of paintings who can never bring himself to leave a canvas in the state he bought it. If it is the portrait of an old woman, he is sure to take the work to a restorer to see if the wrinkles can possibly be smoothed out. If it is a landscape, he invariably has changes to suggest. When the canvas has been truly maquillé, he often takes it back to the auction room to try his chances with some novice. By the side of this character is the cleaner, the man who insists upon cleaning every painting that falls into his hands. On coming into possession, the work may be as bright and fresh as the varnish of a newly painted motor car. It makes no difference, he will clean it all the same. Cleaning spells death to pictures, just as spinach spells death to butter, wisely says the French writer in conclusion, laying down a humorous aphorism implying that to clean paintings practically means to ruin them. The very antithesis of the cleaner is the defiler of pictures, diametrically opposed to the former, who worships soap, dye and other cleaning materials, he no sooner becomes the owner of a painting than he proceeds, as he says, to confer the proper age upon the work, by a coat of dirt, the would-be patterner of age, which he ennobles and honours with various names, harmonising, toning, etc., Curious as it may sound, from among all the queer legion of auction room questionables, this member is less dangerous to art than many others, especially his pendant, the cleaner. This is readily understood when one considers that a skilled hand may remove any artificial patina, which is frequently separated from the pigment of the painting by a hard layer of old varnish, without any serious damage to the work of art, while the cleaning of an old painting proves more or less ruinous to its artistic qualities. In fact, the use of strong chemical means either to remove aged dirt or centennial varnish brings away some of the colour as well. The damage done by cleaning with spirits or other strong methods is exceedingly great to some of the Dutch paintings, finished to a great extent by veiling with delicate layers of transparent pigment diluted in varnish. Venetian works, the colours of which do not always withstand the dissolvent properties of reagent, suffer irreparably from cleaning. According to the author of Les Petits Mystères de l'Hôtel des Vents, it is by no means impossible that the manipulations of these two art fiends may bring it about that a work be bought and cleaned by the cleaner, then put on sale again and bought by a defiler, to reappear at the auction room covered with fresh but soiled and old-looking patina. These two characters, like the maquilleur, are chiefly hobbyists and rarely associate. There are other oddities such as restorers, providers of documents, simple intriguers and unscrupulous businessmen who club together. One of their common schemes is to create pseudo-collections, supposed to have belonged to some noted person. Such collections are often composed only a few days before the auction sale and labelled as the property of Comte X or Baron D, or styled anonymously as being belonged to a well-known collector, or more often uncompromising initials designate the pseudo-owner of the work of art put up to auction. 
the profit to be gained in commending one's own goods and running down those in competition with them is accountable for other strange professions that flourish in the stuffy atmosphere of auction rooms the competition between genuine collections belonging to genuine collectors and these faked ones impels the schemer to extol the importance of the latter which has doubled and disciplines the activities of many strange helpers and queer professions one of the most important personages of this unnumbered company of frauds is the errantier he is as the french word indicates a man whose part in the business is to hang about auction rooms and run down works from which he has nothing to gain or impersonating the character of a disinterested outsider to praise works the sale of which will bring him profit whether directly or indirectly this defamer or praiser of works of art according to orders puts himself in the way of possible clients makes their acquaintance and cleverly manages to influence their opinion as though incidentally he may pass himself off as a simple art lover a dealer or any other suitable character it must be added that the errantaire is not always so venal as to sell his praises or defamation he is not always what might be called professional there exist a number of people who slander merely for its own sake urged either by jealousy evil disposition or a tendency to gossip at important auction sales this over courteous personage is far more dangerous than the man who does his work systematically and as a profession likely to be spotted by the public one of these art slanderers came very near inflicting a deadly blow to the successful sale of a donatello bronze put up to auction in london at a well-known art sale room on the day the objects were on view the work which by the way belonged to an italian antiquary who enjoys the reputation of being one of the best of connoisseurs was much admired by english art lovers and possible buyers a french art writer and connoisseur posed before the bronze and remarked that it was a clever fake possibly an imitation of the eighteenth century the comment passed from mouth to mouth and as the french critic was known to understand the italian renaissance those present expressed doubt as to its authenticity to counteract this unexpected check the antiquary hurriedly threw himself into a cab and visited the most serious frequenters of the auction room during the few hours preceding the sale and thus had time to convince them a new atmosphere soon prevailed and the donatello reached the record price of six thousand pounds it was afterwards discovered that the french critic had had a quarrel with the italian antiquary hence the spiteful comment some of these misrepresenters are not content with going about the sale room in search of opportunities to injure by running down a work or praising rubbish to the disadvantage of good things they pass judgment favourable or the reverse at the very moment a certain object is offered for sale an act which strictly speaking is against the law but the hidden practices of auction room intriguers are more or less baffling to protective laws like all the worthy members of the black band whose chief purpose in attending auction sales is to promote what is called the knockout this is a scheme of combining forces to hamper the natural cause of bidding and to oblige the unwary to renounce competition or to pay an exaggerated price in its simplest and most schematic form the knockout works as follows a certain number of dealers go-betweens or other promiscuous plotters bands together in a secret society for the purpose of discouraging buyers not belonging to their set though secret because of the law the society is in fact notorious among many of the regular frequenters of auction rooms as being both imperious and obnoxious this is not only carried on in paris but in other cities too where auction sale parasites manage to evade regulations and escape the vigilant eye of the law by this system the way is opened to any member of the society to cure an outsider of ambition or hope to buy advantageously at a sale if x a newcomer offers for some object its value or even a trifle more he will nevertheless lose the object or be forced to bid to a foolish figure as one of the conspirators will bid against him and if he happens to be obstinate he will pay dearly but if by mischance the object is left to his opponent after the fever of bidding has inflated the price the society makes good the loss sustained by its member 
dividing the money losses among the members of the society considerably lessens the loss of the bidder who has run the price up to an extravagant figure in order to punish someone they consider an invader the divisions of damages is generally effected as follows after the sale all the objects bought by the partners are put up to auction a second time among the members of the society at this second sale the goods are likely to be disposed of at their real commercial value if as is sometimes the case the total returns of this second sale are inferior to those of the auction room the difference paid to keep in force the rule of punishing is jointly borne by the co-operators and thus the cost of this chastisement game amounts to a small tax that each member of the black band very willingly pays the black band as it is called in paris is so powerful that many not belonging to the society often consent to deal with the members sometimes they ask one of them to buy on their behalf there may of course be a trifling commission to pay a certain percentage but in the end it comes considerably cheaper such transactions are naturally against the disposition of the laws on auction sales and are invariably made without the consent or knowledge of the directors of the sale room and it must be understood that if discovered there may be repression and an unexpected and brusque recall to the strict observance of the law here the fluctuating success of such societies which however notwithstanding the trammels of regulations appear to prosper one way of faking reputations as it might be called by which an object is sold at a higher price than it would reach under ordinary conditions is to list it in the catalogue of a forthcoming sale of some noted collection the faked reputation here consists in the fact that the name and reputation of the collector who had formed the collection bestows lustre upon the object inserted in the sale this illegal proceeding which well-known and reputable sale rooms will not countenance has occasioned endless lawsuits with the usual uncertain results as the illegitimacy of the object is not always easy to prove another method of faking the reputation of a certain work of art is the following suppose a dealer possesses a very mediocre picture of little value and wishes to have documentary proof that the work has cost him a good price instead of a low sum he has only to send the painting to the auction room and ask his comrades to run the bidding up to a certain figure then by buying in his own property and paying the percentage due to the auctioneer he withdraws the picture with the receipt the document he desired by this trick when the opportunity presents itself to sell the work he is able to produce what looks like a convincing proof of his honesty and square dealing you see sir i am going to be very candid and sincere with you here let me show you what i myself paid for this painting he will say and show the receipt at the public auction sale not infrequently the responsibility of the attribution is left to the owner of the work of art by which means objets d'art are often christened with names of a most fantastic paternity this is easily done take for instance a canvas that might or might not be righteously baptized school of leonardo the work is presented by the owner to be sold by auction and declared as a leonardo da vinci and in the catalogue it will naturally be put down to leonardo when the owner goes to buy in his own canvas he has of course no interest to run the price up to a fancy figure his sole aim is to be able to show to some future buyer a catalogue with the attribution printed and curiously enough printed attributions would appear to carry undisputed weight it is nevertheless a bait only for greenhorns with whom its effect rarely fails to prevent objects put up to auction from being knocked down at an unreasonably low figure it is an accepted system to place a reserve price upon them to write down when consigning the goods namely a certain price representing the lowest figure at which the object may be sold the auctioneer keeps this price in pictore on his private list that is to say when the article is put up for sale it is either offered straight away for the price quoted or the latter is led up to by by-bidding if this proves to be impossible the object is bought in and the owner has merely a percentage to pay on the last bid and can withdraw his property thus while an auction sale always presents hazards the reserve price is a guarantee against the risks of flagging moments 
the room may chance to be deserted of its best public through unforeseen circumstances enthusiasm may suddenly cool unaccountably and for these and other reasons a reserve price is therefore a legitimate defence strange to say even this honest and recognised safeguard has been turned to cunning abuse the principle of the reserve price at least has brought into being that questionable personage nicknamed in english auction rooms peter funk a most undesirable faker of situations the fact that the reserve price given to the auctioneer is often disclosed to interested collectors and that it may be divulged by auction room clerks and so become known induced collectors with objet de vertu on sale to send friends or agents secretly in order to run up the bidding to a certain figure the name long since given to this complacent secret partner shamming the art buyer is peter funk funkism if one may be allowed to coin a neologism certainly has its right to existence and originated in the legitimate desire to protect objects from falling at ridiculous prices in depressed moments of the sale but it has now become a regular curse especially at first-class auctions where by reason of the great interest at stake the system can be worked to its full magnitude and no expense spared as an example and one that to our knowledge worked greatly to the advantage of the seller and not at all to that of the buyer from whom funkism robs all chance of the fair play which should be the dominant note in auctions we may quote the sale of an italian collection at christie's at which certainly without the knowledge or even suspicion of the auctioneers peter funk played havoc under every form and guise to make sure that the keen-eyed collectors should not discover the pseudo-collectors the latter were all imported from the continent and given strict injunctions to buy at the stated price to bid without comment and to indulge in none but commonplaces in conversation with the public the dealer employing them knowing how impossible it is for a non-collector or a feigned art lover to say three words about a work of art without giving himself away a good appearance natural bidding without emphasis or theatrical pose an occasional yes or maybe or hem when questioned and a whole string of uncompromising banalities these are the stock in trade of an improvised peter funk who may not be so capable as the professional one but has the advantage of being less easily detected a clever peter funk knows the right moment to run up a price judging from his competitor's enthusiasm up to what sum he can safely bid before abandoning the game and by counting on his opponent's rashness and impulsiveness runs him up to bids which he afterwards regrets risky as it is rarely does an object remain in the hands of peter funk and if it does the owner will supply him with the money and withdraw the article paying the auctioneer's dues a comparatively modest percentage these combined forces in the auction room secretly working as a sequence of traps caused a well-known french collector to propose an inscription to be put over the door of one of these dangerous dens ici il y a des pièges à lui it is not meant by this that all auction rooms are infested by brigands who leave no chance for fair play and that all who ever enter them come out regretting the attempt to buy at a system that appeals to the public for its square dealing not at all the best artistic investments are often made at public sales but rarely alas by the inexperienced novice who has but a limited knowledge of art and is besides wholly unfamiliar with the way of the auction rooms this double form of ignorance needs the warning that there are traps so that coolness and wisdom may enter the brain of the enthusiastic beginner two necessary items in gaining experience at a reasonable price end of chapter eighteen and part two Chapter 19 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Part 3 The Faked Article. Chapter 19 The Makeup of Faked Antiques. Paintings, drawings, etchings, etc. How the art of faking necessarily borrows techniques and experience from the restorer. 
old and modern ways of imitating the technique of painting new pictures on old canvases and old paintings repainted and doctored suggestions for imitating the preparation of panel or canvas imitating characteristic paintings in impasto veiling and varnishing imitating the cracking of varnish old drawings technique of the proper abuse to give an appearance of age to drawings etchings fresh margins to old prints etc opinions as to the restoration of objects of art are of a most varied character more especially in the case of painting an art of rather complex technique the various opinions about the restoration of paintings may however be classified into three distinct categories one might be said to be entirely in favour of the process one entirely discountenancing it and between them one which is permissible as it has to do only with mechanical methods calculated to reinforce pigment or the canvas or panel and is not concerned with what might be called the artistic side of the art such as retouching or filling in the missing parts of a painting speaking of certain restorations of his time even vasari remarks in the life of luca signorelli that it would be far better for a masterpiece to remain ruined by time than to have it ruined by retouching by an inferior hand baldinucci tells us how guido reni objected to the retouching of old paintings more especially the work of good masters and that he invariably refused to do it himself no matter how much a client was disposed to offer for the work Milizia, the architect and writer says that to retouch an old painting particularly a fine work of art is to pave the way for future and wider destruction as in the course of time the retouching will show itself and then another act of barbarity will have to be perpetrated according to the opinion of a well-known florentine antiquary and famous restorer of paintings for the american market a picture has nothing to gain from the hand of the restorer on the contrary his opinion is that as soon as a restorer lay hands on a painting he ruins it the class we have placed between the two extremes the one using a certain discrimination excepting such methods as are intended merely to preserve the work without encroaching upon its artistic merits such as furnishing a fresh panel or canvas to a painting removing old and deteriorated varnish etc being the wise one is of course represented by the minority needless to say the main forces of the class supporting restoration in its extreme form are drawn from the ranks of restorers or authors of works teaching the grand art of resuscitating masterpieces such men as merimee vergniaud prang deon forni and seco suado the latter in fact does not hesitate to call restoration a magic art and depicts the restorer as a regular miracle worker we do not propose in this chapter to follow the various methods of restoring paintings according to the character of the work fresco tempera or oil but simply to indicate some of the restoration processes that are useful to fakers in deceiving inexperienced collectors in the case of faking up an old painting of weak or defective character into the delusive suggestion of a work of good quality the process consists principally of bringing the form into proper shape by veiling and toning the crude parts of the colouring this work the success of which chiefly depends upon the skill and versatility of the forger is generally effected by first removing the old varnish with a solvent there are many kinds of solvents which can be used according to the quality of the varnish the most common however is alcohol it must be very pure containing the minimum of water ordinary alcohol is likely to produce opaque white patches a phenomenon called by the french restorer chancy and very difficult to obliterate once it has appeared being one of the strongest solvents and of dangerous and too rapid action at times the alcohol is generally mixed with turpentine in the proportion of half and half to start with then according to the greater or lesser solubility of the varnish the proportion of alcohol is gradually increased this mixture called la mista by italian antiquaries may be substituted as we have said by various solvents potash soda ammonia etc according to the nature or hardness of the varnish to be dissolved some restorers also resort to mechanical methods to remove old varnish these methods too are various if the varnish is hard it can be cracked by pressure from the thumb a long operation requiring no small amount of patience and skill 
if it possesses sufficient elasticity to withstand this process, it is generally removed with a steel blade in the form of an eraser. The latter operation is not only very difficult but very slow, particularly when the painting possesses artistic qualities that must not be impaired by the removal of the varnish. This first operation successfully accomplished, the artist steps in and proceeds to help the work, say of such and such a school, to resemble the painting of the master of this school as much as possible. The process is naturally executed by the aid of a more or less complete collection of photographs of the work of the master the faker intends to imitate. The retouching may follow the most varied methods. To take the most common case, that of oil painting, the new work can be carried out with oil colours previously kept on blotting paper to drain off the oil which is then substituted with turpentine to give the colours their lost fluidity. It may also be affected with tempera colours or with colours the fluid element of which consists only of varnish. The use of tempera is preferred by restorers because, although it presents the extreme difficulty of changing hue when varnished and consequently demands no little experience to judge the requisite hue or tone, still once laid down it is not likely to change with time as oil retouching on old paintings generally does. The mixing of colour with varnish alone has the advantage of keeping the proper tone from beginning to end. This method is extremely useful not only in the painting of missing parts but also to veil and tone what has been painted in tempera if this is not entirely harmonious with the rest after varnishing. Needless to add, those colours the fluid part of which is supplied by varnish are unalterable as they do not contain any oil whatever. One of the difficulties in handling these pigments is the lack of fluidity, hence turpentine may be added with advantage. However, as the above methods of retouching are not proof against chemical tests, alcohol being the proper solvent with which to do away with added touches to old paintings which have been done with either oil or varnish colours, the shrewder fakers either mix amber varnish with the colours or give the fresh touches a solid coating of this varnish, which when well prepared is supposed to be insoluble and not easily acted upon by solvents. Although more than one special work on the art of restoring gives recipes for the preparation of this varnish, in practice very few know how to prepare it in the proper way. We have here presupposed that the picture was in good order, that there were no missing parts of importance, or rather that, with panel or canvas unimpaired, the work only required to be retouched by the artist, a rare case, as when the paint has vanished, the preparation of the panel or canvas has generally vanished with it, on account of its adhesiveness. We do not propose to give the various recipes for the plaster dressing forming the preparation of the panel or canvas. They are different according to time and country and can be found in special works on painting. Under ordinary conditions it is very easy to substitute the missing preparation, just as it is easy to give it the proper surface either by pumice or skilled coating with the brush. But in the case of a painting on canvas it is very seldom that there are not big holes right through it. The first operation in such cases is to re-canvas the work, to line it, namely, with another canvas, which is pasted to the old one and flattened with an iron till perfectly dry. The missing part must then be filled in, imitating the weave of the canvas on which the work is painted. No easy matter this, as the different weaves of canvases are as characteristic as signatures, no two are ever alike. The new canvas showing through the hole is therefore either covered with a patch of canvas taken from some corner of the painting to be restored, or it is given the same appearance by pressing a piece of the old canvas upon the fresh preparation of the part missing, thus moulding the texture of the threads. This must be done skilfully in such a way that the parallel lines of the threads match. There are some clever fakers who imitate the old canvas by strokes of a hard brush upon the fresh preparation of the new pieces, reproducing the characteristics of the canvas by actually copying from the original parts. When a painting is finished, there are various methods by which an appearance of age may be given or restored to it. From asphalt to licorice, hundreds of things are used, either dissolved in turpentine or water, glue, albumen, etc. Veiling with varnish, coloured with the proper pigment, generally gives the finishing touch. The imitation of old and cracked varnish is simple enough. First, one must give the canvas a coat of diluted glue, then varnish before the glue is quite dry. 
as the under layer of glue dries quickly and has a shrinking capacity disproportionate to that of the varnish it is easy to understand that the result will be a cracking of the varnish a closer a coarse network of cracks is obtained by increasing or decreasing the inequality of shrinkage between the two layers or by hastening or retarding the drying of the upper layer by artificial means although comparatively easy these operations nevertheless demand no little experience to be crowned with due success if a painting has been repainted only in the parts that were missing and the old varnish has not been removed from the rest of the picture it is a question of not only giving the varnish of the new spots cracks like the old varnish but these must imitate as closely as possible those of the original part of the painting in such cases a needle is used to make the cracks on the newly varnished parts when the grooves have been made in the varnish they are filled in with water and colour or soot to give them the desired appearance of age such roughly is the method mostly in use for oil paintings with the necessary variations and the use of the proper medium the same method also answers for tempera it is rare that frescoes are imitated or retouched but in such cases fresh cheese is used as the vehicle for the colour and when dry it not only acquires the quality of insolubility but also the opaque hue of the fresco as far as technique is concerned the imitator does not find it easy to imitate the work of those artists who paint in impasto that is to say with a thick layer of pigment the consequent characteristic strokes of the brush requiring no little experience for reproduction in all their force character and characteristics through long study and practice some finally succeeded in imitating the works of such painters as rembrandt or franz hals but such cases are extremely rare forney who has written a work on the restoration of paintings suggests a method of imitating impasto painting with its characteristic brush strokes which in our view can only be applied in the case of repairing a part missing in some old painting Forney's method consists of first reproducing the peculiarities of the brush stroke in a plaster composition, closely resembling that of the preparation of the canvas, and then giving the proper colouring. According to Forney, this method has the advantage of giving the impression of a frank and vigorous style of painting, such as is usual with the impasto technique, yet it has been achieved slowly and patiently one of the side businesses of picture faking is the providing of suitable signatures when one considers that paintings generally bear the artist's signature more especially in recent times it would be strange if this branch of the shady trade did not number specialists who can imitate signatures to perfection as well as reproduce artists special monograms it is easy to understand how old drawings and sketches may be imitated just as in the case of faking a painting the artist tries first to become familiar with the work he wishes to imitate it is then usually executed on old paper and when finished soaked in dirty water dried and scoured with pumice to give it the apparent abuse of age some imitators however do not give themselves the trouble to find the proper paper and it is not unusual to see imitations on modern paper or would-be sixteenth century work on paper bearing the mill mark of two or three centuries later but these of course are the gross imitations only intended to dupe the most naive of beginners prints are also imitated and nowadays to perfection with the help of mechanical aids when they have to reproduce an excellent original the aging process is the same as that used for drawings there is one difference between them to be noted it is that in the case of old prints or etchings the presence or absence of the margin counts for much an etching with its original paper margin is far more valuable than one that has been cut to fit a frame or for any other purpose hence one particular branch of faking of prints is to refurnish paper margins to those specimens that have lost them the work is more or less successful according to the skill of the faker but is usually effected in the following manner the etching is cut all round the edge reasonably near the printed part then a large piece of old paper is cut to fit the etching as a frame and the two edges are brought and held together for some time by a paper lining at the back the crack at the join between the old etching and the new margin is filled in with paste of the same composition as the paper and smoothed even by a mechanical process it is of course needless to add that such a method is not likely to take in a true collector but the faker knows that foolish clients are sometimes numerous and his best supporters miniature work is easy to imitate not only on account of its technique 
in which originality has a comparatively small role to play, but because it needs hardly any patina or ageing. Pastels and watercolours, more especially the latter, appear to be a little out of the forger's line, yet pastel, with its peculiar technique, affords possibilities for faking. Copies of noted originals have not escaped the speculative spirit of the counterfeiter. They are generally sold as contemporary copies or antique copies, and they seem to command higher prices, even if an old copy is at times far inferior to a modern one. In the faking of modern or semi-modern art, the technique intended to confer age and venerability to the work finds no place. In such cases it is easy to understand, the main craft lies in imitating the style of the master counterfeited. Speaking of such imitations, we may note that fakers contemporary with the artist are perhaps the most dangerous to the neophyte, as imitations have always existed more or less, and are by no means only the product of greed of modern fakers and dealers. A collector is often taken in by a false coral, or a false rousseau, in which the only legitimate thing is perhaps the date, the forgery having been perpetrated during the master's timeline. Naturally, the imitation is not always made for the purpose of cheating, but almost always with the hope of becoming as popular as a certain master by imitating his style. It is very often the work of pupils, as in the case of the Votto imitations by Lancre and Pater. It is known that the work of Paul Potter has been imitated by Klump, that Jacob van Housum has been counterfeited by the works of Bruegel and Vowermans, that Constantine Netscher made plenty of money copying Van Dyck Charles I portraits, and that Tenier the Younger sold false Titians. To go back to prints and etchings before closing this chapter, one must make a distinction between old imitations and modern ones. A good connoisseur is never at a loss to detect signs of counterfeit, but there is an essential difference of criterion needed in judging old imitations of etchings and modern imitations. In old prints, involuntary discrepancies are sure to occur as they have been reproduced by hand, and the connoisseur must therefore be acquainted with them. These variations are more or less known to experts, whereas in the case of a modern, purely mechanical reproduction, a magnifying glass and technical experience are the chief requirements. Marco Dente's reproduction of Marc Antonio's work and the copies of Callot's etchings by some of his pupils are examples of the imperfections of old imitations, details having been omitted. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 20. Faked Sculpture, Bas Reliefs and Bronzes. Faked Sculpture. Clay Work. The False Tanagras. Imitation of Renaissance Work. Bas Reliefs and Busts. Baked Clay and Stucco Duro. The Claudians. Bronzes. The importance of patina, the patina of Pompeian bronzes and excavated bronzes, Renaissance patina and that of later times, gilded bronzes, marble work in its general colouring, sculpture in wood and ivory, the cheroplastica. We must repeat that in sculpture also, faking borrows largely from the art of restoring. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to say that nearly all branches of the faker's art turn for help to the restorer's methods. And here again, as in painting, we are also immediately confronted by two forms of trickery. One is the creation of a modern object in imitation of the antique so as to deceive the collector, and the other the reconstruction of some fantastic piece of forgery from an inferior object, or one greatly damaged by over-restoration. To speak of over-restoration is in such cases to use a euphemism. We can offer an example showing how this over-restoration of objects is nothing but a form of faking highly flavoured with different varieties of deception. A rich American bought a marble statue some years ago representing a famous Roman empress. It was bought not only because the Roman art appealed to him, but as the portrait of that particular Roman empress. As a matter of fact, the whole statue had been faked by the addition of new portions to a headless, limbless torso, which was the only genuinely antique part. 
We must say, however, that the new head given to the half-faked statue was extremely well done. It had been copied from a well-known model, and except that the patina of the marble was not so perfect as might have been expected from a great master in trickery, the most experienced collector might have been deceived. Clay work is perhaps the most popular form of plastic art among the fakers of antiques. As it has the special advantage of being made from casts of originals, it does not present any real technical difficulty, and demands no expensive additions, and may be given colour and patina with comparative ease. Of course, many of these advantages are also shared by bronzes, stucco, and all productions worked from an original model in clay or any other plastic substance, such as wax, pastiline, etc. Tanagra figurines undoubtedly hold the first place in the large class of faked clay work. There has been an uninterrupted succession of forges in this line from the time Tanagra work first came into fashion with collectors, to the stock imitations now sold in Paris and still bought for genuine Tanagras by over-naive collectors. The old Baron Rothschild, who had a fine collection of Tanagra figurines, and no small experience as a connoisseur, used to say that when it is a question of a Tanagra one must see it excavated, and even that nowadays is hardly a guarantee of genuineness. The imitations are generally cast from good originals, and as the clay shrinks considerably in drying and baking, the imitation is usually smaller than the original and can therefore easily be detected when confronted with a genuine piece. Some of the more advanced imitators have somewhat obviated this difference of dimension by mechanical methods of expanding moulds, but the work in such cases is not so perfect as otherwise, and what is gained on the one hand, namely a dimension identical to that of the original, is lost on the other, as methods of taking oversized moulds from the original are generally imperfect. A flourishing product of the Italian market are bas-reliefs and clay busts in imitation of Renaissance work. When not the work of clever artists who model directly from the clay, having studied and mastered the old style, it is the product of miserable mechanical deception, aided by ability to disguise its patchwork nature, the trickery and general sleight of hand of the wily art of faking. In the case of bas-reliefs, they are often composed of different parts belonging to different originals, sometimes originals unknown to connoisseurs and art critics. This method has been applied to the imitation of Renaissance terracotta busts. A bust bought at a high figure from a Venetian antiquary many years ago and believed to be a genuine Quattrocento work was afterwards discovered to have been made from the cast taken from the face of a recumbent figure on a tomb in the church of San Pietro e Paolo, to which had been added the back part of another bust, the whole finally set upon a pair of shoulders cast from another original of the period. The monument from which the face had been moulded was so high up on the wall of the church of San Pietro e Paolo that no one knew of the existence of this original, and the other parts of the faked object had also been taken from little known originals. The fraud was discovered in Paris some time after the bust had entered a noted collector. A lawsuit ensued, and the collector eventually recovered the money he had paid. Italian art of the 15th century has produced many clay bas-reliefs, apparently from one and the same original, and yet presenting slight differences, additions and modifications, evidently made after the clay had left the mould, but when it was still fresh. This fact has greatly incited the fancy of Italian forgers, and largely contributed to the confusion of art critics and the duping of more than one collector. These bas-reliefs represent sacred subjects for the most part and sometimes it is not merely a question of putting a rose in the Madonna's hand or a little bird into those of the infant Jesus in order to lay claim to due originality, but the modifications are so radical that the whole appearance of the work is changed. It is generally done as follows. A good plaster mould is made from a good original, and a clay reproduction formed from this mould, which is then modified and changed while still fresh. Should the work to be divested of its original character represent, say, a Madonna and child, the artist may proceed to alter its size by modifying the border. Then, to transform the subject, he may make an addition to one side, of the heads of the ox and ass, taken, of course, from another original. To change the pose of the Madonna, the clay is generally cut behind the head and neck with a fine wire, and then the position of the head can be altered at pleasure, from being erect, for instance, it can be inclined, or vice versa. 
By the same method, and no small amount of skill, arms and hands can be given new attitudes, etc. The final result is a work which passes as an original among foolish art lovers who collect series. Stucco duro imitations are produced by almost identical methods. These compositions are generally made of plaster, which hardens as it dries after being poured into a mould. When the original is to be modified, a first model of clay or some other soft modelling material is indispensable, of course, and from this mould it is then taken for the casting of the stucco duro. To colour and give a patina either to baked clay or stucco is comparatively easy. The colouring is given with tempera colours, the patina with tinted water, for which tobacco, soot, etc. may be used, applied with smoky and greasy hands. A coat of benzene in which a small quantity of wax has been dissolved is finally laid on with a brush and the whole polished with a brush or wool. As we have said, however, fakers are especially partial to clay work. It requires little outlay, the finished work can be fired at small expense, the colouring and patina can be given at home, not needing the special lights of a studio, etc. Not only in the case of Renaissance work has this method been the favoured one, but in other types of art forgery, the 18th century terracottas, for instance, the lovely work of Claudian, Falconet, Marin, etc., Paris is glutted with imitations of Claudian's clay groups. Some of them are sufficiently good to puzzle the best connoisseurs. As we have seen, a pseudo-Claudian sold years ago in perfectly good faith by Monsieur du Boulet to Madame Bois caused a complicated lawsuit and many inconclusive discussions among art critics and connoisseurs of the calibre of Eugène Gulliam, Chapou, Millet, Claret Bellus and specialists on Claudian's work, such as Theocor. It was finally established that the bit bearing Claudian's name was authentic and had been inset in a group of much later date, a spurious original, but even this was not absolutely proved and simply offered as the most accepted hypothesis. As Paul Eudel remarks, to decide the matter, Claudian would have to raise the stone of his sepulchre and to rise from his tomb in order to supply an irrefutable solution. The initial process of faking antique bronzes is very similar to that used in clay and stucco forgeries. By initial process we mean, of course, the way the mould is made for casting the bronze. When the pseudo-original has been modelled in clay, the form of it is naturally taken to obtain a matrix of some harder material, and from this matrix is taken the mould that is used for the cast. There is also another system of casting bronzes generally in vogue among fakers, more especially for small objects, which is known as cire perdu. It is a simplified method, consisting of modelling the object in wax, then taking its mould, which is emptied by melting the wax. The details of the two methods of casting bronze, the ordinary casting and the cire perdu process, can be found in any technical work on bronze casting and need not be repeated here. The patina of bronzes presents a difficulty, in addition to the artistic difficulties of creating a convincing pseudo-original, difficulties common to clay, stucco, and, in fact, all faked sculpture. Patina, the nobilis irugo of Horace, is the peculiar oxidisation acquired by bronze with age. For the connoisseur, the patina is not only a part of the artistic tout ensemble of a bronze object, so much so that there are collectors more impressed by the beauty of the patina than by the artistic value of the piece, but it is the chief indication of the authenticity of the work. According to Pliny, great importance was attached to the Nobilis Irugo by the Roman connoisseurs also, especially in the case of the famous Corinthian bronze. This metal was classified into five qualities by the Roman amateur according to five different hues or patinas depending on the proportion of gold and silver in the alloy. Roman art lovers made a regular study of bronze patina and of the composition of the bronze of art objects. The components of this knowledge were not only gathered from the appearance of a certain bronze but by its relative weight and the odour of the metal. That the odour of an alloy should have been made a test to judge of its component parts is very possible as the smell of bronze and brass is essentially different, and there is no reason why a practised Roman nose should not have distinguished slight differences according to the proportion of the various metals in the alloy. 
One reason, apart from artistic motives, why the collector gives the patina so much consideration is, as we have said, because the patina nowadays is one of the safest guides in buying antique bronzes. Whilst the artistic qualities of certain objects may be reproduced with skill or trickery, patina of a really genuine and entirely convincing appearance is supposed to be beyond the faker's art. Our own and other people's experience leads us to doubt this. But such, as a matter of fact, is the common belief among collectors. Faked patina, it is true, is less transparent and duller than the genuine, and can easily be detected by shininess at points and sharp edges of a bronze where it is difficult to fix the imitation patina. But, we would repeat, there are bronzes in Naples and some of the cities of northern Italy that have deceived the best connoisseurs, and samples may be seen in nearly all the important museums of Europe and America. Almost all works treated specially of metal casting give various methods of obtaining a proper patina according to the different hues one may wish to give the bronze. Yet modern methods of colouring and oxidising bronze do not seem to satisfy the antiquary, and, in consequence, the faker of antique bronzes. All modern mechanical methods produce fine colouring without brilliancy, colouring that does not seem to possess the vibrant quality of old patina, oxidation that appears to be too superficial to show the depth of colouring peculiar to patina obtained by the slow process of age. To obtain such an effect, the faker resorts to the most varied and out-of-the-way methods and when possible tries to hasten the slow oxidation of age by greasing and smoking the object, putting it in damp places and treating it with acids. Often the most varied methods are used in conjunction or alternatively with a patience and persistence worthy of a more honourable cause, but practised with ever greater keenness, alas, with the promise of much gain. Some of the most successful patterners are obtained not only by duly working at the colouring and oxidation of the metal, but by composing the alloy in such a way as to favour the production of a convincing patina later on. Naturally, the differences of the patina of old bronzes depend not only on the various conditions to which the work may have been exposed through age, but upon the colouring or kind of artificial oxidation that may have been given it upon leaving the foundry. Thus, whilst an antique bronze brought up from the bottom of the sea may have the peculiar patina of age acquired under these special conditions, and another statue exposed only to the atmospheric oxidation may show the different hue belonging to the atmosphere of air, there are bronzes which have been coloured upon leaving the foundry, and even when age has given brilliance to the patina, they bear the characteristics differentiating the school or artist. The most difficult to imitate are the excavated Greek, Roman or Etruscan bronzes, especially when the humidity of the soil or some peculiar condition has produced a kind of patina possessing the appearance of enamel. Among the artificial hues of Renaissance bronze, the brownish tint of the Paduan school is characteristic, and worthy of note are some of the blackish specimens of Venetian bronze as well as the whole emporium of samples of the versatile Florentine school. Some of these patinae are reproduced fairly well, and now that Gian Bologna and his school are beginning to be appreciated, we would state that faking is successfully studied to produce the reddish patina of some of the not always exquisite, but yet invariably interesting little bronzes of Tacca Susini Francovia and others. It was once believed by some collectors that gilded bronzes could not be imitated, that the galvanoplastic method was as recognisable as any false and badly made coin. We doubt this, for we fail to see why the old system of gilding with mercury could not be applied to imitations. It is somewhat slower and more expensive, but the profit, as usual, makes it worthwhile in the eye of the faker. Gilding is certainly imitated to perfection on modern pieces purporting to be the work of French artists of the 18th century, and some of the counterfeits of Guterres's and Caffieri's work have even the varnish that was at one time considered inimitable. The great progress made in imitating patina has rendered the collecting of bronzes one of the most dangerous branches the collector can choose. In the case of marble, stone, or other hard materials that has to be chiselled, the faker generally starts his work along the lines of the sculptor, that is to say, he models the original in clay, casts it in plaster, and transfers it to the marble by the usual methods. 
then when this artistic part has been accomplished successfully the marble or stone must be given the appearance of antiquity and the patina belonging to age this is generally effected by two distinct operations one relating to the form the other to the colour and the whole peculiar harmonization of tone and polish called patina as regards the form modern sculpture being somewhat too precise and sharp-edged the chief aim of the operation is to destroy these qualities as well as to confer upon the object the abuse that is supposed to be traced upon an antique during its long pilgrimage through the ages the marble is therefore skilfully chipped here and there with mallet and chisel sand and acid are applied to dull the oversharping tooling and sometimes to cause corrosion etc the principle accepted it is easy to understand that ways of ageing sculpture are multiplied and vary according to the illusion the faker intends to convey the fact that old greek and roman work is not identical with renaissance productions in appearance as the former are generally excavated while the latter come down to us through a long succession of owners is sufficient to show that there are slight differences which must be taken into consideration for colouring marble and stone a general tone is usually given at first which is intended to destroy the crudeness of the new material especially in the case of marble one of the most common ways is to wash the object with water containing a certain quantity of green vitriol when applied before the stone has lost its permeability this solution penetrates deeply particularly in marble and the colouring is not easily destroyed or washed out by long exposure to atmospheric action some use nitrate of silver also when a different hue is to be given but the solution mentioned first which confers the proper ivory tone to the marble is the most common naturally a tone given by these means is too uniform and monotonous to be taken for the colouring of old age so the artist calls his talent and experience into play by producing the desired variation there is in fact no other teaching but experience and taste it is to be noted that in the colouring of stone and particularly marble the artist has an almost complete palette at his disposal for in this branch chemistry supplies nearly every hue possible we may remark by the way that the art of colouring marble was already well understood in the days of ancient greece and it is a fact that more than one statue of that period shows signs of colouring wonderfully preserved through the ages in italy where marble dyeing is still a flourishing art it is done with very few colours verdigris gamboge dragon's blood cochineal redwood and logwood nearly all vegetable dyes are suitable and many coal tar colours if properly used give a very fast and beautiful colour to marble it is essential for the solution of all dyes to be made with alcohol or ether and only such anilines may be employed as are soluble in fat some solutions may be applied direct to the marble whatever the temperature others require the heating of the marble to increase its permeability and consequent faculty of imbibing the colouring solution the quality and condition of the marble must also be taken into consideration if the marble has not been polished properly or has been touched with greasy hands a patchy effect or stains will result rubbing with flannel and the moderate use of encaustic gives the finishing touches when the character of the patina requires the shiny effect so often seen in old marbles objects sculptured in wood represent no change of technique for the forger of antiques as far as the carving is concerned the forger's ability to imitate the work of an old master is purely artistic and cannot of course be achieved by any special method but the art of giving the object a convincing appearance of age is fairly mechanical depending on the use of alkali permanganate of potash and other substances the process being somewhat complex and common as a matter of fact to all kinds of wood carving it will be given in detail when imitation antique furniture and the methods of producing it are described faked furniture being perhaps one of the most productive branches of the obscure trade of counterfeit antiques sometimes artistic figures or bas reliefs in wood are either coloured or gilded in the case of polychromatic work the wood is generally coated with a plaster preparation to receive the colour and the technique for ageing or giving a patina is that already described for stucco or clay work in the case of gilding the appearance of age is given to the new gold by colour veiling also licorice juice and burnt paper are used with advantage applied to the gold with a soft brush 
ivory work too, which represents one of the most dangerous fields to neophytic enterprise, requires no special technique in counterfeiting as far as the artistic creation is concerned. It must also be tempting to the carver as a material, for certain naive effects of primitive art seem aided by the essential qualities of the ivory, its fibrous constitution in particular. One may safely say that there is nowadays hardly a single genuine Byzantine Christ. There are, however, plenty on the market, of course. The old cracks of antique ivory are very easily imitated. There is more than one method for producing them. The most common is to plunge the piece in boiling water and then quickly dry before a fire. The operation can, of course, be repeated until the desired effect is attained. Here, also, smoke and tobacco juice can perform miracles. Sometimes ivory pieces are placed into a fermenting heap of fertiliser or wet hay. The methods are, in fact, most varied, and an inventive spirit seems of great assistance to the faker in devising new schemes every day. We now come to the last class of this chapter, Ceroplastics, which includes all forms of modelled wax, small bas reliefs supposed to have been the originals of plaquettes, little family portraits in coloured wax, etc. In this branch, patina and complicated methods to attain an appearance of age hardly come into consideration. The mere touch of the hand is at times sufficient to stain the wax, and work of this kind takes the colouring so readily after it is modelled that no craft is needed in imitating old waxwork, provided the artist is able to imitate the antique handiwork. Besides, wax portraits have been for the most part kept under glass, and have come down to us fresh as though made yesterday, not only those of a century or two ago, but also those that have reached a most respectable centennial age. Waxwork is one of the easiest to imitate, and one of the most difficult to detect when imitated. We are therefore inclined to advise the freshman collector to abstain from buying this kind of work unless irrefutable documentary evidence is offered in the shape of a well-authenticated pedigree of the work. End of chapter 20《Chapter 21 of the Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. • Chapter 21 — Faked Pottery Faked pottery, old unglazed types, artistic and scientific interest in pottery, oriental glazed pottery, Greek and Etruscan half-glazed vases, faience and its various types. Italian factories, Cafagiolo, Urbino, etc. Iridescent glazes, Hispano Moresque, Deruta, and Gubbio. French pottery, faked palissy and imitations of Henry II. Other types of French faience, China, the old and modern composition of China, various ways of faking China of good marks, half faked pieces blunders in marks, glasses and enamels. Pottery presents one of the richest and most varied fields for imitation and faking. The endless types and specialities of this class seem to have spurred the versatile genius of the imitator. Broadly speaking, an age apart, pottery may be divided into two classes, one in which glazing does not appear, and one in which this important element of ceramics lends an entirely different character to the product. The first class more especially, if not exclusively, may be grouped into two types according to character, those that interest the scientist in particular, and those that come more into the domain of the artist and art lover. It is of course understood that there is no definite line of demarcation between the two. Faking, however, with a great spirit of impartiality, makes no distinctions and is ready to meet its clients on the scientific or artistic field, and fully prepared to accommodate the scientist with an artistic bent, or the artist possessing the learned propensities of the historian. Thus Mexican idols and Peruvian pottery, as well as the productions of savage tribes, are imitated and copied with the same interest as the unglazed vases of Samos, Greek clay urns and Roman lamps. What regulates the increase of the forger's activities and spurs his genius is, as we have said, the demand for an article and its price. 
There is nothing surprising then in the fact that some rather indifferent types of pottery of savage tribes or incomplete aboriginal specimens should have been faked as though they presented the interest of a chef d'oeuvre. Not altogether of this class, but certainly of limited interest so far as art is concerned, are the Mexican articles which have been among the most exploited by those who know that these kinds of relics are in great demand by scientists as well as collectors who have a passion for specialities. In the exhibition of 1878, a group of scientists put the incautious upon their guard by exhibiting a whole series of faked Mexican idols, pottery and so forth. But as the articles, especially at that time, were in great vogue, the warning was not sufficient for specialists and collectors, and the show of faked Mexican art proved such a success that it stirred the honesty or cynicism, we hardly know which, of a Parisian dealer who conceived the notion to advertise his wares forgeries of Mexican idols, 5 to 25 francs. Unglazed Oriental and Greco-Roman pottery with its fine forms and decorative character has not only proved an attraction to the collector but is very tempting to the faker who finds no great difficulty in imitating it. The way to render such pottery antique looking is easy. Acids may play their part here too but they are hardly necessary as the porous nature of the clay makes it able to absorb any kind of hue, tone and dirt if buried in specially prepared ground or in a bed of fertiliser. Curiously enough, from one point of view, the imitation of this early art generally flourishes on the very spot where the originals are excavated, and still more odd is that on more than one occasion those duped were the very ones supposed to be good connoisseurs and who took direct interest in the excavations. Thus it is that there is an abundance of faked Samos, Rhodes and other specimens in collections now housed in museums. A superficial inspection of the Cesnola collection in the Metropolitan Museum of New York ought to be sufficient to prove that even connoisseurs as good as Cesnola are not quite safe in this speciality against the trickery of modern imitators. With Greek, companion or Etruscan pottery that bears a peculiar polish or glazing the nature of which is still a mystery to ceramists, the case is somewhat different. Good imitations are rare. Naturally, there cannot be included among convincing imitations those upon which a lead glaze has been used, as such imitations are covered with a thick layer of shining glaze and are only intended for various neophytes who have presumably never seen an original. Successful imitations are either finished with a very thin and non-shining glaze or an encaustic polish. To ascertain whether encaustic has been used, one has only to rub the piece with a cloth soaked in benzene, which will soon turn it opaque. In the Pottery Museum of Sèvres, there is an interesting series of faked Greek and Etruscan vases, urns, etc. It comprises some good specimens of the work of Touchard, an imitator flourishing about the year 1835, other pieces by the Giustiniani of Naples, and some of the most successful fakes of this particular kind of pottery, the pieces by Krieg from the Rheinzebahn factory. These pieces were sold to the Sèvres Museum as genuine by a Bavarian in the year 1837. We are told that a good method in imitating Etruscan pottery is to work with engobe, adding a well-ground frit to the barbotine that contains the elements of a glaze. To our knowledge, all imitations of this kind are wanting in appearance and it is safe to assert that they could hardly receive serious consideration from a true connoisseur. As regards glazed oriental ceramics, there are to be noted some good imitations of Persian work and, above all, imitations of the characteristic pottery of Rhodes. Factories for these ceramics are almost everywhere. Perhaps the best imitations come from a factory in Paris. Imitations from this factory have succeeded in deceiving more than one connoisseur. A well-known curator of a Berlin museum bought one of these samples as genuine, paying £80 for it, and an antiquary in Florence, quite a specialist in ceramics, very nearly committed the same mistake, but by good luck he was warned by a friend who had been taught by hard experience that this oriental pottery is a product of very western origin. Curiously enough, the manufacturers do not sell their produce for anything but imitations. However, through the usual frauds in which the market in antiques abounds, these pieces are evidently palmed off on unwary collectors outside France. 
Oriental pottery is usually so well preserved, thanks to its hard glaze, that the faker is spared all complicated processes to give the piece an appearance of age. The glazed work of Hispano-Moresque pottery presents a more or less successful field to imitators. The lustrous glaze of various hues does not seem to offer difficulties to the modern ceramist, who has learned how to use the mysterious cooperation of smoke in the so-called muffle glaze. Yet when confronted with originals, which are becoming rarer and rarer in the market every day, the best of imitations leaves room for meditation as the genuine is usually a very uncomfortable neighbour to the counterfeit. The Italian Renaissance, with its various and interesting types, has yielded a fine crop of imitations. In fact, plagiarism was already rampant when the old factories, now extinct, were in full activity. Thus, on more than one occasion, Faenza has copied Cafagiolo, and the works of Urbino, Pizarro and Casteldurante are often interchanged, while the factories of Savona seem to have blended its unmistakable individuality with the models of all the most successful factories. Cafagiolo, Gubbio and Derutha are perhaps the types of old Italian pottery to which the faker has given preference. There are some modern imitations of Cafagiolo made by a ceramist of Florence so well done that they have deceived the very best connoisseurs of Paris and Berlin. But for the fact that we have pledged ourselves to point out the sins and not the sinners or their victims, we could enumerate a rather interesting list of illustrious victims to this clever imitator of Cafagiolo, who is still at work in Florence and more dangerous every day by reason of the perfecting of his deceitful art. There are also old imitations of Cafagiolo, made by the Sicilian factory of Caltagirone, and if only one thing surprises us more than another, it is that good collectors should buy this type freely as genuine. They are apparently blind to the grossness of the imitation, and above all to its dark, dirty blue, which has nothing in common with the beautiful colour of a genuine Cafagiolo. Another cherished type offering great enticement to the Italian faker, even though not imitated successfully enough to take in the real expert, is the work of De La Robbia. Imitations of this work, copies from good originals and honestly sold as such, are to be seen at one of the most important potteries in Florence, Cantigali, a firm of almost historical reputation. Being intended to be sold as reproductions, copies or imitations, no patina is given to these. It is not only in Italy that Italian films has been freely imitated, but also in other countries, particularly France. Among the successful imitators, we may quote Joseph Dever, who made such good imitations of Italian films that he had the honour to sell some of his specimens to the Sèvres Museum in 1851. Looking now at these imitations of Della Robbia, made so successfully by Dever in 1851, one wonders how they could have been taken for genuine by experienced connoisseurs. The lustre work of Maestro Giorgio Andrioli and De Rutha has been imitated by many factories, but notwithstanding the efforts put forth and the progress made in discovering the secrets of lustrous glazing, the imitations, especially of Maestro Giorgio, are deficient. In the Gubbio work of the best epoch, a special firing must have been used, especially for the red hue, which is so original and characteristic that it seems to defy imitation. That the Maestro Giorgio's must have been glazed at a low temperature, at any rate for the production of the iridescent effect of its colours, may be concluded from an incident that occurred in Gubbio years ago. On the spot where Maestro Giorgio is supposed to have had his furnace for firing his masterpieces, some debris of fine Gubbio work was found. By chance, a woman put one of these pieces that had apparently not received the last firing for the iridescent hue into the warming pan with which she was warming her hands, and the moderate heat of the ashes was sufficient to produce the iridescent effect. Imitators of this kind of work use various methods, but one of the most common is muffled glaze, specially prepared and aided by smoke, which envelops the piece when incandescent and the glaze about to melt. In France, the hard-glazed work of Palissy was naturally an incentive to the imitator's versatile aptitude, and later on to the faker's. 
being as esteemed for his work as ill-treated for his religious convictions palissy had many imitators in his own time mostly among his pupils or enthusiastic followers however palissy died in the bastille without revealing the secret of his glaze or the composition of his clay so even his followers could only grope in the dark to use the expression by which palissy defined his long and arduous research before he discovered the secret of his marvellous pottery perhaps because plagiarists are after all always plagiarists the fact remains that none of the sixteenth and seventeenth century imitators reached the level of the master however fake palaces are legion now they are of all kinds and the originals being now practically off the market museums as usual abounding in pseudo palaces so a comparison with an original is not always possible apart from his immediate followers palissy was copied and imitated at avon near fontainebleau in the seventeenth century during louis the thirteenth's reign demain a real authority on palissy ceramics mentions that many fine palaces now in museums some of them regular pastiches suggested from well-known prints of a later date than palissy according to demain some of these pieces are in the victoria and albert museum the motives of the composition old-fashioned gardens being taken from engravings in the style of lenotre possibly dating from sixteen o three to sixteen thirty eight in modern times there are to be noted imitations by alfred corplet a restorer of pottery who filled the market after the year eighteen fifty two with possible imitations sold as such of palissy work for a long time he had been a restorer of broken and damaged palissy work and thus he had had opportunity to study the work of the master closely and at one time his imitations fetched high prices a m pull also imitated palissy work about the year eighteen seventy eight as well as barbizet brothers of whom a plat a reptile is kept in the Serre museum some firms even reproduce sea fish which are never found on genuine palaces as the master only moulded such animals and fish as he found in the environs of paris there are many fakers who still love to imitate the work of palissy and if we may give advice to the inexperienced collector we would say don't go after palaces nowadays as a find in this line is almost an impossibility good originals are either kept in well-known collections or jealously guarded in museums henry second fails the technique of which is as much a mystery as bernard palissy's glaze has also been imitated but with the exception of a few specimens the imitations are so coarse that they could hardly be dangerous even to the neophyte who had perchance some slight acquaintance with the originals as in the case of palissy however henry second ceramics do not abound on the market and such a thing as a find is not to be hoped for more common are the imitations of rouen mustier down to the ceramics of the revolution the latter were at one time in such demand that a very commercial type was produced which can be imitated of course with ease in this field also therefore do not get excited too quickly over some truculent subject with the conspicuous date of the terror naturally among these subjects the assiette au confesseur and a la guillotine depicting the execution of louis the sixteenth are too tempting to forgers not to be given a certain preference among the faked pottery of the revolution we would point out further that the pottery of all parts of the world has invariably been faked or imitated as soon as a promise of success was presented to the imitator and of gain to the faker but it is not the purpose of this work to make a long exposition of the countless types of faking which would certainly increase its bulk and risk monotony by an endless list of names and almost identical facts with the usual dramatis personae the cheater and the cheated to give an appearance of age to pottery especially glazed pottery there are various methods as we have already said sometimes it is not only a question of determining whether an object is genuine or not but as pottery is apt to be one of the most restored articles of antiquity offered to the collector 
the art lover must be acquainted with the means of detecting which parts of a piece of pottery have been restored, often over-restored. There are two ways of restoring pottery where parts are missing. One is to make the missing part in clay, bake it and glaze and colour it to imitate the genuine piece of the object. When this is done, the new part is cemented to the old and the piece is supposed to have been only broken and mended, a fact that does not lessen the value of the object in the eyes of the collector so much as incompleteness would. As this operation is an extremely difficult one which only a few specialists can perform, there is a Florentine ceramist who does it to perfection, and very expensive as well, only really fine pieces of pottery are restored in this way as a rule. Ordinary pieces are repaired as follows. The fragments of the object are carefully cemented together and the missing parts are then supplied with plaster. Some use plaster mixed with glue, others some similar composition. In fact, any soft substance will do if it will harden after it has been modelled and properly shaped. When the missing parts have been filled in and carefully polished with sandpaper, they are prepared for oil paint with a light coating of a weak solution of glue. After this, the artist paints in the missing pattern with oil colours and a brush, copying from the original parts of the object. This finished, the glaze is imitated by a coat of varnish. Incredible as it may sound, in the hands of a clever artist, this rather clumsy method produces an almost complete illusion. It is, however, easy to ascertain what parts have been repaired. The new parts are warmer to the touch than the glazed pottery and they will also smell of turpentine or oil paint. Should an old mending have lost all smell, the heat of the hand is sufficient to revive it. Place your finger for a time on the part you suspect, then smell it, and you will be able to detect whether the part has been repainted with oil colours. A piece repaired by the other method is naturally more difficult to detect. An experienced eye, however, will notice some slight differences in colour and form between the old and the new parts, and sometimes the join is not quite perfect, a defect that is often remedied by filling in the crack with a mastic imitating the glazed ground of the piece. This rarely occurs, however, as a good repairer can generally calculate to a nicety the shrinkage of the parts to be added and make such a neat and perfect fit that only an experienced eye can detect it. In the case of a purely modern imitation, the faker's art consists, as usual, in giving the piece a convincing appearance of age, once the actual making has been performed. This is generally effected by exposure to apparent ill usage, by greasing and smoking the object, then cleaning it and repeating the operation over and over again until the dirt has penetrated into all the cracks, or by burying it in a manure heap and letting it remain till it has lost all freshness. There are also chemical ways by which the glaze is eaten and the composition altered. It is a fact that fluoric acid readily eats the glaze just as it dissolves glass, and under certain circumstances the lead in the glaze under the form of silicate changes under the action of hydrosulfuric acids. Cracks or a regular network of craquelage are generally produced on new ceramics by the same principle as they are obtained on oil paintings namely by producing artificially a difference in the shrinkage capacity of two superimposed layers. In oil painting it is the layer of pigment and of varnish. In the case of pottery the two layers are represented by the baked clay and the glaze. If the clay has a smaller shrinkage than the glaze, in the second firing of the piece to melt the glaze, the latter will dry in a network of cracks like those on Chinese or Japanese vases which are reproduced by this method. Reversing the game, the glaze peels off here and there in drying and produces the imperfections sometimes desired on imitations of old and damaged pottery. An artificial disproportion between the shrinkage of the clay and the glaze is usually obtained by modifying the quality of either the one or the other. Does the clay shrink more in the firing than is desired? The ceramist generally mixes it with non-shrinking elements, such as powdered brick, or even another kind of clay which he knows must shrink less on account of its composition, although it may not be suitable in colour and quality. 
by this same modification of the composition the shrinkage of the glaze is increased or diminished glazes are generally composed of a composition of silex furnished by sand and oxide of lead with the addition of some flux such as borax with an increased quantity of silex in the composition of the glaze the shrinkage capacity is diminished Consequently, a predominance of the other elements, lead, flux, etc., produces the opposite effect, namely giving the glaze a greater shrinkage capacity. Some workmen prefer to modify the quality of the clay to obtain the desired craquelage, others find it more practical to modify the glaze. A full account of faked china would probably fill a bulky volume, it may be taken for granted that every kind of artistic china worth imitating has tempted the faker, with disastrous results to the unwary collector. We have mentioned some of the most noted forgeries of Faience, merely to show what a happy hunting ground ceramics have been to the faker of all times, and with china this is doubly the case. From the early attempts of Botka, those rare specimens of rare china, down to almost modern samples of Sèvres, there has been a long succession of types that have kept generations of fakers and imitators incessantly busy. Curiously enough, and with no intention of cheating as far as China is concerned, noted factories have themselves greatly added to the confusion between originals and copies by becoming their own plagiarists, as it were, by imitating old kinds. Thus, the Messon factory now puts upon the market types of old Dresden very satisfactory to people not intimately familiar with the fine old models of the factory. The same has been done at Sèvres, Doccia, and other factories. Then, too, in some cases, the plagiarism is furnished with distinguishing marks that have increased the confusion for the neophyte collector, be it understood. It is well known, for instance, that before closing its doors towards the end of the 18th century, the Capo di Monte factory sold all the models of the factory to Ginore's noted china works at Doccia, and together with the models the rights to use the N surmounted by a crown, which was the Capo di Monte factory mark. Ginore's factory has ever since reproduced imitation Capo di Monte with the mark of the Royal Neapolitan factory. Of course, the pieces may be sold by the firm as Ginori ware and not as Capo di Monte, but once on the market they are sure to come into the possession of some unscrupulous dealer who will palm them off as Capo di Monte. A good connoisseur, however, can tell almost at sight the real Capo di Monte from the ones Ginori's factory has been turning out for more than a century. The latter are not so fine in form or colour, and although made from the same mould, are not so well finished and retouched as the real Capo di Monte. Apart from this, a large contribution to imitations of highly reputed china is made by smaller factories that find it convenient and profitable to copy pieces of celebrated marks. Some of these factories even go so far as to imitate the mark, rendering the deception perfect. There is another form of deceit in the market for artistic china, peculiar to this artistic branch. Many factories are in the habit of disposing of such artistic pieces as are not considered altogether up to the reputation of the factory. These pieces are often bought by clever workmen who embellish them with skill and patience and then sell them profitably. If the mark is missing, it is added with muffled colours. To obviate this irregularity, some of the best factories either erase the mark on the wheel or cut certain lines in the glaze which indicate that the piece is genuine but not recognised by the factory as up to its standard of artistic value. Of course, even a moderately expert collector knows the indelible sign made over the genuine mark, but there, nevertheless, seem to be people who buy such pieces under the impression that they are genuine first-rate Dresden, whereas no other claim can be made than that the white background and the mark are authentic, both baked at Gran Fuco, as the decoration is generally muffled work and can be executed by any skilled workman who has built a muffle in his house. Nowadays, defective pieces are destroyed by reputable firms, but years ago they were not only sold off, but even given to the very factory men who took them home, decorated them, and put them on the market as genuine pieces. 
some of these curious fakes are naturally almost as good as the genuine article, being at times the work of the same artist, and the defect of the first firing is not always visible, as a slight curve in a dish or a tiny speck in the glaze of a vase is a sufficient blemish for the piece to be thrown aside by the factory. Where the faker does not always display his usual sharpness is in the falsification of marks of noted factories. He is apt to make gross mistakes by copying a mark from the original without knowing the historical characteristics of the marks of certain factories, their peculiarities and eventual changes. Take, for instance, the Sèvres mark. It is known that instead of dating the pieces in figures, the Sèvres factory began in the year 1753 to mark the pieces with an A between the entwined initials of the king's name, and that each successive year was marked by the French alphabet till the letter Z was reached in 1776, after which the alphabet was repeated again, doubling each letter. Thus, 1753, A. 1776, Z. 1777, AA. 1793, ZZ. It is, however, not unusual to see a faked piece of Sèvres imitating the work of the end of the 18th century wrongly marked as to date, the faker having evidently copied the mark from an original, unaware that it represented a date as well. The incredible ignorance can only be explained by the fact that many of these clever imitators are artists altogether unacquainted with any information outside their imitative arts. There are also other difficulties in the imitation of Sèvres and its marks, more especially the pieces of the above series of which the faker appears to be unaware. Besides the factory mark, in the alphabet series particularly, there is always the special mark of the artist who did the decoration. These marks are generally not very conspicuous, initials, dots, lines, etc., and belong to specialists, miniature portrait painters, landscapists, or simple decorators. By copying the old marks mechanically, without knowing the information carried by the artistic's initials or marks, the faker is liable to attribute a piece of faked landscape painting to a portraitist and vice versa. Errors of this kind are more common than is generally supposed. In faked china, there is no question of patina or devices by which to confer an appearance of age to the price, nor of artificial breakages, for, by a freak of connoisseurship and contrary to faience, repaired china has lost in a great many cases all artistic and monetary value. We now turn to glassware and enamels as bearing a certain affinity in the domain of faked art and antiquities with the glazed pottery already illustrated. The Museum of Saint-Germain contains specimens of faked Roman glass with iridescent effect produced by the queer scheme of sticking fish scales to one side, which as everyone knows are iridescent a most naive form of faking, to which later progress in the grand and artistic profession of duping unwise collectors hardly renders it necessary for imitators to have recourse. Phoenician glass, the little scent bottles, the so-called lacrimatories, or tear bottles, furnish a large source of profit to the faker. They do not command high prices and appeal to the less fastidious class of collectors, tourists, and are sure of finding purchasers. Interment in earth or manure gives the desired iridescent quality to the glass in time. From these antique types we will proceed to others of more recent times which demand more care and skill to imitate, not so much on account of the art as the peculiar defects of certain kinds. While Cologne distinguishes herself with imitations of specimens of old glass, the so-called product of excavation, and other cities of Germany reproduce old national types, Italy has revived old Murano with a certain amount of success, as well as various kinds of Quattrocento and later samples. These imitations are not always made with the intention to deceive, and their success depends upon the class of collector. He who has perfected his taste finds that although they may approximate to the old originals materially, artistically they are wanting. The excess of precision that belongs to modern reproductions somewhat lessens the artistic effect and forms one of the salient differences between old and new. 
but these after all are not dangerous they represent the cabotage on the sea of deceit there are also fine pieces of real artistic value that are imitated by artists of every nation such as old bohemian chefs d'oeuvre murano chandeliers the latter sometimes composed of old and modern parts cut glass is another branch in which the skilled imitator has triumphed the work of valerio belli and others is so well imitated that even the best connoisseurs are deceived with regards to enamels we would repeat the same refrain do not buy them unless you know whence they came and until you have traced at least two or three centuries of well authenticated pedigree there are other imitations in the antique market which are quite easily distinguished but there are others regular chefs d'oeuvre of art and craft that defy and have in fact defied experience and knowledge not all imitations are by laudin or noyer whose work may be of interest to the accommodating taste of lovers of imitations but there are products of a higher grade unfortunately for collectors and museums and these are not sold as imitations but good round sums have been paid for them and they have in a way ruined the reputation of more than one collector and expert the technique of the work is identical with that of the past and the process for giving an appearance of age very much resembles that already described in this chapter though there are some fakers who claim to have found a patina that cannot be dissolved being incorporated with the enamel as a glaze obtained in the second firing the many lawsuits and summonses at the court with respect to the buying and selling of counterfeit enamels are ample proof that faking is rampant also in this interesting branch of art collecting it suffices to say that among the illustrious victims of faked enamels there is to be included the elder baron rothschild or le baron alphonse as he was briefly called among antiquaries the first of his bad experiences in faked enamel was revealed to the wealthy baron by mr mannheim one of the finest and most honest connoisseurs of paris then taking his first steps in the traffic with antiques from the first mannheim had an excellent eye and he discovered that a place of honour was being given to a false piece in baron alphonse's rare series of choicest enamels at first he did not dare to reveal the secret but after having gained the certitude that not only the one piece but others also of the collection were more or less clever fakes he took the opportunity to speak that was offered one day by the baron's praise of this fine piece of enamel at first the baron was of course obstinate in his unbelief but upon a final test and the opinion of other experts mannheim's good eye finally triumphed the chef d'oeuvre and other spurious pieces for which the multimillionaire had paid a fortune disappeared from the collection long after the above experience with which mannheim's name was connected rothschild bought an altarpiece of immense value and great artistic merit this fine enamel had been sold to the baron by a london dealer who had evidently bought the piece as an antique and did not scruple to sell the rarity to his best client for one million lira having been told by his dealer that the enamel had originally come from vienna baron rothschild one day pointed it out to an austrian attache his guest commenting upon its beauty and his own good fortune in having it in his possession he concluded by expressing his surprise that austria should let such a fine work of art cross the frontier the attache said nothing in the presence of the other guests and only whispered to his host i will come to-morrow to tell you what i think of your find the next day in fact he returned and revealed to the baron how he had been deceived in what he thought to be a precious original as it was nothing but a copy of a well-known altarpiece preserved in vienna he was even able to name the man who had made the copy of the precious enamel a certain verninger who had secretly made a reproduction while restoring the original the baron claimed and obtained his million from the london dealer whose good faith in this affair was beyond question and a warrant was issued against mr verninger the dealer did not recover the price he had paid but mr verninger was sentenced to five years imprisonment ample time in which to meditate upon the reprehensive side of his alluring art as usual we must conclude the illustration of this particular branch of the trade with a warning for if baron rothschild had to regret the acquisition of expensive enamels and he is not the only conspicuous connoisseur to do so what is the fate likely to overtake the first exploits of a neophyte in the field 
if not assisted by a first-rate expert, the freshman had better not meddle with enamels for a long time, but assuage his passion by going and admiring well-known and authentic pieces in famous museums. End of chapter 21